So I guess I'm out of the book club. Howdy. Am I saying howdy? I'll say hello. Okay. <laughs> we worked it's it more... out beforehand. Yeah, we did. <laughs> totally. Hi, everyone. But, yes. I'm Carter. Hi. I'm Alex. <laughs> You're watching Book Club on Unsafe Space. This is, um, we delayed this book for a week because of, I don't remember why. Oh, because we were a band. <laughs> yeah, because of the band. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how appropriate. Uh, yes. We were a band. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna let Alex, Alex, I'm gonna let you take it away, and I'm gonna just jump in because uh, you're, you're much more organized than I am. Okay, all right. So uh, this is we're doing Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses, a uh, very popular novel right now because of uh, the attack that Salman Rushdie faced last month. Um, it was, or was that like August or September? Like I can't quite remember the date but i think it was august yeah actually no i, I think it was because right, we but... picked the book and we needed at least a month to read it yeah and we picked yeah. it after the attack so that's right so it was august yeah. but yeah, yeah he was attacked in august uh very um horrifically right before he, he was going to give a speech on the freedom of speech um <laughs> so uh and well we decided that because of that, we wanted to read it. Like I'd read Salman Rushdie before. I don't think Carter had at all. Um, nope. But this is his most famous novel. And so let's talk about the Satanic Verses. And yes, I made another one of these. Uh, so bring that into presenter view. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Why did it do that? I want this. Yes. Okay. So, The Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie. Why you should read the book, though. It has beautiful prose. It has a mastery in tonal shifts. Uh, it has a very interesting perspective on Muslims and uh, culture clash. And it shows, it, it plays with the idea of the dual nature of humanity. And it is a very uh, interesting piece of contemporary history. Anything I, can to I add? just, yeah. yeah, well, uh, I've, I always, I can't shut up. I always have stuff to add. <laughs> I, I want to point out before we start, I didn't realize this because not being a Muslim uh, and, or re like even remotely around Muslims my life, my whole life, um, I didn't realize that the satanic verses um is a phrase that is not does not originate with this book. I thought whenever I heard that phrase, I assumed that it was just in relation to this book. But it's a it's a part in I guess in the Quran. Is that correct? Where uh, Muhammad I guess has some revelation and then later decides that that was the Satan talking to him. Is that correct? Yes, and what it it would so. A big part of it has to do with the fact that uh, Islam is monotheistic and uh, he essentially the idea was is that the satanic verses are naming three like essentially demigods under God, under Allah. Um, and he he said those lines and then 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 later retracted them, saying that that was Satan speaking to him, uh, going back to a monotheistic uh idea of their religion so that that's where that comes from uh which yeah, the, I, the book does reference it does um and i'm but i'm glad i looked that up first keith is the one who told me like no this comes from this is prior to the book um and it was helpful and then reading that part of the book which we won't get into right now but like reading that part of the book i was like oh there's a story behind this and you kind of see the fictionalized at least uh, yeah, version story. of it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I'm, I won't say anything else. So let's. I'll let you keep going with your intro. Okay. <laughs> uh, so first on the beautiful prose, uh, Rushdie's style displays a very firm grasp on the English language, which, by the way, the Satanic Verses 
is written in English originally. It's not written in uh, another language, even though Rushdie is from uh, the subcontinent. Uh, his work is often based on the sound of words as much as their meaning, which makes reading some of his work actually work out better if you read it aloud. Um, if you uh, can't, if you have a context for much of what's going on, if you don't, then you probably should be reading it for real, but um, as opposed to listening to it, but his work is very poetical um, and not, not like typical fiction style that is very um, just blankly descriptive as opposed to uh, focusing on the sound of words. You know, I, I'm just going to throw this out there. You love listening, and maybe you have the context. I started listening to this book and only because the uh, paper copy didn't arrive in, in time. So I started listening to the book. I ended up, I finished uh, the last couple hundred pages reading the book, not listening. And I much preferred reading. And But the, the reason for that for me is I think I fall into the category of, of a person who's not familiar. The context that you need in order to really get comfortable with this book is like you need familiarity with London and British culture, which Americans kind of tangentially have. But if you're not, uh, you know, if you're not an Anglophile, you might not know a lot of it, right? I mean, I've been to London a few times, but I don't know all the different districts and blah, blah, blah. Like, that's not my thing. Um, it requires familiarity with India and Indian culture. Totally not on my radar other than having watched a couple of Bollywood movies. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I do like good Indian food. Uh, and it requires a familiarity with Islam, which I basically had zero. So those three factors made it actually really difficult for me to listen because I was very – it was like – uh, proper noun after proper noun after proper noun, none of which I understood. Um, and so it, it was like, that was very, very tough for me. I just going to throw that out in the, 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 the pros, there are some beautiful, there's also some clunky sentence construction, I think, but he's got really good, like use of language. And like, there are some beautiful turns of phrases in here. Like there's spots that are just like, oh, I love the way he said that, or the, you know, the words he chose. So there's definitely that. It is also, I also just think like the sentence construction is, maybe that's just because I'm dumb, but like reading it, <laughs> like this is a little bit clunky. This is like too much. There's like parentheticals and like <laughs> lots of stuff going on. I'm like, this is way, you're like going off on a tangent in the middle of this description that I don't need. Um, that is so, you pretty know. typical of magic realist writers is, is to, the oh. garden path sentences is like, it's like a conceit of the genre. Like, I, I don't think it's a conceit of the genre that a lot of people who don't know magic realism are aware of, but it's a pretty, like, it's pretty high level. Like, if you're not playing with language, you're probably not writing magic realism. This is essentially what it is. Oh, interesting. Out to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, like, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm a noob. That, yeah. <laughs> because oh. I am such a huge fan of magic realism, like to me, I'm so used to it at this point that I, I'm not even when I throw a magic realist book at like book club or something, I'm not even like, oh, wait, I should warn you guys. That, <laughs> because it's so I'm just so used to it after 20 years of reading it. I'm like, yeah, that's just how it works. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll stop for now and keep going. <laughs> All right. Uh, next, we have tonal shifts. Uh, Rushdie often showcases an ability to shift between comedic and philosophical tones in easy turns, and I don't find it jarring, And but it forces you to pay closer attention because you don't know, like, it's, you realize after the shift happens that it did happen. Uh, he does this really well in the first chapter when, um, in the first chapter, two people are falling from the sky, and it is bizarre and at times really funny because it's so weird uh and then it switches to this incredibly philosophical idea of uh about life and everything and it's it's very well done and he does that throughout the entire book and he does that in his other novels too yeah i i liked i didn't mind those i thought those were done well the tonal shifts or the shifts that i had trouble with at the beginning at least were like the perspective shifts. There's a lot of different vignettes, and uh, when Jabril's dreaming, 
and it's like, wait a minute, we were just talking to these people. Now we're talking about these other people, but sometimes the names would be the same, but like totally not the same. It was just like, it took, it took a little bit of, and maybe that was because I was listening. It was much easier reading, but also mm -hmm. it was the end of the book. So I already knew it was, that was happening. So I'm, I, I can't tell what made it easy. At one point, I literally asked you if you knew if it was a dream. <laughs> Through, throughout yeah. the month, I was like, wait a minute. I had figured it out by then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, next, we have the interesting perspectives. So the book is inspired by the life of Muhammad, the, pro the Islamic prophet, but it doesn't name him directly. But it, I think it also calls in other religions because there's a, a scene on a plane with an American Christian who's proselytizing to those around him. And uh, it essentially, the, the book kind of make, makes fun of him and as does uh, the main character finds him annoying, one of the main characters. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but it also shows uh, how cultures that are too different in their values will clash when put into close proximity and that may result in violence. And I think that's uh, pretty strongly shown in this book. Yeah, uh, there's definitely an awareness of cultural values and conflict, conf conflicting cultural values in here. And we can get into that later, but I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it also talks a lot about the dual nature of humanity. Uh, there's two main characters and one is cast as an angel and the other one as a devil, but they're so alike. And at times it is actually hard to tell the difference between the two of them. Uh, and I believe this is because while perception may instill the idea that someone should be a villain and someone should be a hero, the idea uh, is actually a farce. And I think that's what that uh, perspective of the novel is trying to show you. Yeah, I definitely had, uh, it had tones of that famous line from Solzhenitsyn, like the, the dividing line between good and evil runs through every man's heart. I'm paraphrasing, but uh, that was definitely part of it. I found myself, by the way, uh, bummed out at one point that Chamcha was the devil because I was like, he seems like a better person than Farishta right now. <laughs> Not that he's perfect <laughs> by any means, but uh, yeah, so I that was good. Uh, and then it is a piece of history. There were a bunch of protests and riots and bans when the book came out uh, in various places. And then later the Ayatollah of Iran issued a fatwa against Rushdie for writing the novel. Uh, and it's led it to physical attacks against him, like the recent one, and um, ad, uh, against his translators, two of which were actually murdered. Uh, the Satanic Verses is one of the most well-known examples of a blasphemy law being brought down upon speech, um, yep. despite the fact that Rushdie is probably one of the biggest champions of free speech in literature right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have a question for you about this part. Do you, I, not being Muslim, I couldn't figure out what part of this is actually blasphemy other than, other than you wrote about someone who is kind of like the prophet and you didn't just write the Quran. Like, it seems like he, he didn't like say, oh, he wasn't like overtly critical of, even of Islam, really. Um, he just... Wrote, so it's like, if you wrote out, like, if you wrote a story, uh, let me translate it for Christians. If you wrote a story about Jesus skateboarding, would that be blasphemy? Like, would that, would there be like, if there was like a, you know, Jesus hangs out with Bill and Ted, is that blasphemy? Because I, I don't, this doesn't seem much different than that other than, you know, maybe questioning the nature of good and evil, but this, he's doing it within men's hearts. So that's not even like a, I, I can't imagine that's blasphemous. Like people have the capacity for both. Like that, is that blasphemous? Do you know what's blasphemous about this? Like what's, what the, what these specifically the arguments are? I don't know what their arguments are, except for the fact that he's, there's the implication that Muhammad was um, misled throughout the entirety of his uh, writing down of 
the Quran and that in times his writing of the Quran was selfish, that there were doctrines that he mm-hmm. would come up with that would benefit him the most. Um, so those are those are a couple of ideas. But then also it's it's somewhat supportive of apostasy uh, because Jibreel is having these dreams about the prophet because he's losing his faith. Um, mm. So he's questioning everything about Islam. Um, and I think that's probably the more uh, dangerous thing to uh, extremist Im- Islam uh, Muslims is that it's supportive of apostasy, which they are very against. I don't think sure. they would want sure. to have a novel that shows let's go through this journey of apostasy and see why someone would feel this way. <laughs> I don't think they would be supportive of that. Okay. I guess that makes, I guess that makes sense. And, and the, uh, and you're right, the kind of revelation as convenient ways of getting what he wanted was definitely yeah. <laughs> part of the story for <laughs> yeah. the Muhammad character of like, oh, isn't that convenient? <laughs> like, yeah. The, the angel agrees with that. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they would find that uh, probably an insult to the prophet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Because it okay. was magical realism and difficult, how many people that actually uh, hate him do you think actually read this? I don't think most of them. Uh, I I honestly do not. Be- most of the time when someone wants to ban something, I don't believe that they read the thing that they want to ban. Like, I mean, a good example of that is... Um, I think it was Abdul wanted to ban train spotting because he said it glorified heroin use. And, and then he had to later uh, admit that he'd never seen the movie. And it's like, obviously, because the movie does not <laughs> glorify heroin use. Um, and that happens a lot. A lot of people say they, which is why when you try to dig into why it, with an individual specifically, why you want to ban this book, they really can't give you an answer. Uh, because they just, it's, it's sort of like the whole arguing with a poster, um, problem. Like they have sayings, they don't have evidence. And I, if you don't want to read it, I don't blame you. Like if you don't want your religion, you don't want to read something that makes you question your religion. I don't blame you. You don't have to. I don't, I don't think that's necessary for you to say that you don't want to read it. But if you want to tell other people not to read it, you probably should read it and then give me reasons why, you know, (laughs) Um, at the same time though, I 100% am not for the idea that you can tell other people whether or not they can read another, (laughs) uh, a book. (laughs) So (laughs) fair enough. Um, Fair enough. Let's let you do the summary and then we can further discussion. Okay. So uh, the summary of uh, for this book is that it follows uh, the religious actor, Jibril Farishta, and voice actor Saladin Chamcha, which is one of the reasons why it's hard to tell the difference between the two of them is because they both are actors, uh, both before and after a terrorist attack on their shared commercial flight ends with their falling into the English Channel uh, and surviving, by the way. Jibril dreams he is an archangel who gives holy verses to a prophet and Saladin transforms into a devil. And their, re- their lives circle each other throughout the novel and that's that's a basic summary i mean i think it's a great summary i mean, just the the construction of it if if anyone's interested in reading it it is um it is filled with i would call it like um it's a bunch of vignettes that are stitched together but there is a through line uh in the vignettes but you'll you'll switch from one to another and they are relevant and they do relate they relate to one another um but uh, it it is a little bit weird. The very beginning is like, wait, they're we're falling. Like, what's happening? They're falling. <laughs> like, yeah, they're literally falling from the sky after a plane explodes <laughs> over the English Channel, and like fl- like floating towards each other as they're falling and circling each other. Which I think that's yeah. important. That the fact that they're circling mm-hmm. each other and getting closer because it actually foreshadows what's going to happen throughout the rest of the novel. And, yep. and they start singing in unison, essentially. <laughs> and then they join together and they survive. They don't die. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, 
And it's bizarre because even from that part, it's not just a straight up realistic falling from a plane with them circling and singing, which is weird. Uh, there's also like visions happening and, and that kind of stuff going on right from the beginning. Um, yes. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Let me ask you a question, Alex. Okay. Because this is something I thought I knew the answer to <clears throat> until close to the end. Who's the narrator? The narrator in Salman Rushdie's work appears to me to always be Salman Rushdie. I thought he was, I thought the narrator, okay, so I'm, <laughs> I thought the narrator was omnipotent and omniscient because there's, there's a few spots, not a lot in the book where the narrator just, it, um, the, the entire perspective changes and the narrator just speaks to you directly. It doesn't happen often, but it's, it's there. And there's one point on page 423 in my copy, which is this mass market thing here, uh, where the narrator, he's, he's talking about not intervening. Um, and he's like, I'm saying nothing. Don't ask me to clear things up one way or another, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, where's the pleasure if you're always intervening to give hints, change the rules, fix the fights? So like, there's that implication. And, and so I was like, okay, he's like God or an omnipotent thing like the writer. But then later on 439, he uses this phrase that confuses me. The narrator again says, as my understanding will allow. And I've kind of like that kind of threw me because if you're the, because Salman Rushdie is the God of the universe he's creating. So why is his understanding? <laughs> why does he not understand? Um, well, I could say this as a writer sometimes. E even I'm not sure what is going on in what I write, especially as a magic realist writer, because sometimes you're just free association to get some of this weirdness out, you know? And, and you're like, I don't know what that means necessarily, but I'm going to put it down because it is adding something to this. Like you might cut, like still editing happens with magic realist writers, obviously, but like, you know, um, these ideas that may end up meaning more than what they did when you were uh, putting them forth at, at first. Uh, so, and I don't have answers for everything that happen happens in a magic realist story that I write. I don't. Uh, okay. I, I, and I don't try to have it. Like I, it's usually the answer with writers with almost every other genre that you try to have an answer for everything. Like if you, if you have an ambiguous right. ending or whatever, you try to know what the actual answer is. But m with magic realism, there's a little bit more of the subconscious at play there uh, that you're, and you want to leave it alone for the, like often you want to leave it alone because uh, okay. you, you want to, you want to even leave it ambiguous to yourself. I know that's that's that sounds like a cop out, but it is what allows magic realism to stay weird. Okay, so the narrator is indeed Salman Rushdie. He's just letting things be. He's created these characters, and he's just decided that he doesn't know what why some things are happening, yeah. and that's just all right. I guess I can get. I guess I can wrap my head around that. Um, I have another question for you. Okay. Did you find it funny, at least towards the end? Like, how how funny is this book to you? I laughed a lot. Like, okay, a lot. <laughs> I I did not. I I it, it was like mildly amusing at times until close to the end, and then I just found myself laughing out loud. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I wasn't sure that I was supposed to be, but I felt like I'm like this is just hilarious. Uh, so, okay, I'm, one of the things I'm going to say is that I really, the, the first spot where I noticed I was, like, really laughing, and it wasn't just at a joke, but it was at, like, the buildup. It was at, like, um, it wasn't just at, like, a, a funny phrase or whatever, because I had laughed at spots like that, but this, that, I, I laughed at something, like, significantly structural or, like, significant to the plot was the, was, was, Chumcha's verses. 
Mm, uh, which yeah. which are the satanic verses in the book? The satanic verses have a meaning. Yeah. Uh, in the story between Jibril and and Saladin Jamcha, and his verses are just so stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just so man. dumb. They're just so stupid. A lot of I gotta read some of his verses because <laughs> there's like it's this. The whole book has this very uh, deep feel to it, like because he's going in and out of philosophy and asking difficult questions and his vocabulary is outstanding. So there's just it feels very erudite. And 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 then and then you run into like the satanic verses, which are I like coffee. I like tea. I like things you do with me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's the end and these stupid little limericks or or phrases i guess they're not limericks uh they drive this character it, it's like it's this tiny it, i love that it's this tiny thing that Saladin figures out it's just this tiny thing that drives him that that breaks the guy finally well i mean i think a big part of it is that uh, those limericks are bringing home the idea that he's a cuckold and he, because his wife is literally with another man. Um, and like, they're like living together too. It's like extremely awkward. It's so <laughs> awkward. Um, and like, it's like it, the bringing home this, uh, like it, it attacks all the things that like a, a, a man from that culture might find uh, is like extremely insulting. Like he was, basically ignoring it and then these limerts are just like in his face throwing it in his face like and he and he has no control over it like they just call and they and they (laughs) you know the guy calls and he and he's pretending to be different people every time and (laughs) and putting forth the these these rhymes to uh you know call into question his manhood and the virtue of his wife it's it's intense from that perspective and that's why it drives him crazy but as a reader it's just humorous to us you know we're like why is this the thing that's setting you off so hard (laughs) (laughs) it's it's pretty it's pretty funny and i will say i what i liked about it by the time i had that's pretty late in the book but by the time i had gotten there um because i i struggled with getting through the book at the beginning um because it was like so much stuff going on and I wasn't sure where this was going. In fact, my daughter at one point asked me, does the book have a plot? And I was like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I'm not sure if this book has a plot. But by the end, it, there was payoff. It was like, oh, there is payoff. It did have a plot. It was worth it. And I was laughing out loud at, at the satanic verses and some of the other stuff going on. And it has resolution. It has all the things that I wanted in it. But they kind of they came late, and I wasn't sure. I had put a lot of work to get there. It yeah, had more resolution it, than House of Leaves, by the way. Speaking of medical yeah, realism, it uh, it's. Yeah. Uh, I would say that it is definitely a slow burn of a book, uh, and I I appreciate that kind of writing myself. Like, um, it's like as long as you can make beautiful prose, and like in, like I am going to be there for until you get to your point. If, if he had a less um poetical style and told the same story i probably could not get through a book like this um because it's not that you have to give me something to dig my teeth into along the way and uh i have read books that are slow burns that are more stayed in their writing style and it's just not like i'm like i'm bored i don't want to keep going uh, so that's one of the reasons why I like magic realism is because it can get that slow burn, but usually with the the weirdness and the and the language can keep me going. Hmm. Hey, Caleb, how you doing? Hey, <laughs> uh, pretty good. Uh, apologies for my uh, tardiness. I that's okay. Something came up on. Uh, I, I had plans to get here on time and then didn't. <laughs> So that's fine. That happened. Uh, what what are your what are your thoughts? I don't know. I don't know how much you've heard. We've gone through a basic a basic summary. We didn't give away the end really or anything, but we've gone through a basic summary. We've we've talked about why the book's important. What were your thoughts? Uh, you know, I, I'm sure in your basic summary you covered what those satanic verses are in Islam and how mm-hmm. that where that comes from. And I, I think. I don't know if you if you guys have covered this, but 
I, one thing that interests me is the theme of infidelity in this. Uh, because there is a very, I mean, obviously there's a recurring theme of cheating and infidelity in the satanic verses. Um, and I, on some level, it always seems to me as if that is a way for Salman Rushdie to, essentially, if that relates to his not being Muslim, as if he, or to his no longer considering himself Indian. You know, the, the Britishness of Chamcha is something that I think is is very autobiographical on Rushdie's part, or I would assume that it is. So I think the idea of infidelity, that you're cheating on someone, I, it seems to me that he's expressing the, the way that he felt about leaving India and leaving Islam, or at least that, that's what I get out of it. Uh, there's a lot of historical stuff that I feel like I need to understand in order to fully get this. That There's quite a bit. Join the club. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I understand, uh, I understood the, the bits about Muhammad. And when I did the research on what the satanic verses were, you know, I understood the stuff about Jahiliya, which is Mecca and all the rest of that. Um, so th there's a lot of cultural backdrop here that I don't have. Th that being said, I, I, I guess uh, on like a technical or a literary level, what really sticks out to me about the satanic verses is Rushdie's sense of humor, which, which is legitimately really funny. You know, um, the, I think one of my favorite parts is when is when they hear an intrusion, the, the man and the woman do, and they they both creep downstairs and they're both wearing one of her frilly nightgowns. <laughs> <laughs> and they and they've each got a hand on the hockey stick like i laughed so hard when i read that uh i yeah. i that's one of it, it's it's not common that a book makes me laugh out loud and, and this one does frequently rushdie is just really funny in that way mm -hmm. uh i want to get to another... the humor but i can we can we pause on something you said earlier before the humor because mm -hmm. i don't know too much about rushdie other than that he's a british indian born british author um and I was curious about how similar he might have been to Chumcha. Uh, do, do, do we know, like, for sure? Like, did, did Rushdie not consider himself Indian? Because that's actually quite interesting because Chumcha is cheating, quote, cheating on his culture in some way. At least that's how he feels about it. He comes back to his culture in the end. Like, there's a reconciliation there. Um, and there's a whole section of the book where he's talking about um, – uh, I forget where it is in the book. I might be able to find it, but there's a whole section in the book where uh, he's he's talking about um, the goodness or evil in a in in really in. A, I don't know that he means this is actually what he's saying about good and evil, but he's using it as a kind of way to look at Jibril and Chamcha and saying that Jibril is kind of more true to himself, um, and Chamcha is kind of is kind of uh, cheating almost on himself because he's trying to deny his his history and his culture and his past and he's kind of it's it's uh i didn't really uh, like that analysis because it, it it assumes that uh your conscious choices aren't yourself and that it, you kind of you have to like embrace your subconscious only to be who you want to be but like that seems to be kind of a message and then chumta does return to india at the end how similar actually is that to salman rushdie I mean, of course, Rushdie never returned to India um, yet. But I, I do know, well, I guess he's still got time if they don't stab him again. Uh, yeah. He, but, they might stab I, him in India more likely than they would here. So maybe he needs to stay. True. There. True. He, he, might, he might head back to, uh, to Mumbai and get stabbed. You never know. But, you know, it, it's I, as far as like how much the character, how much Chamcha is like Rushdie. I, I don't know a ton about him. I do know that he's an atheist and it, it certainly, you know, he talks about atheism as being basically a British thing or as, as something essentially British. Now, how much of that is he, just him doing a really good job of stepping into these characters shoes and how much of it is coming from his own experience? I don't know. And that's something that's a challenge that I think, uh, that, that, that's kind of the mark of a good author, I guess, is the fact that someone can step into a character's shoes enough to make you wonder if they're speaking from experience, because that's a sign that they're able to make it feel real. 
Uh, yeah. So, so I mean, looking at his Wikipedia page, it looks like he was he immigrated to the UK in uh, looks like. Oh, geez. It uh, doesn't say when he he was already there in the 70s. So maybe when he was in his 20s or 30s, I think. Uh, so so I mean, he'd been there long enough to consider himself a British person, essentially. And that's, I think, one of the major themes of the Chamcha is like, am I am I English or am I Indian? Um, yeah. But on the on the subject of the sense of humor, there was one part. Let me see if I can find it, because it is. It's one of the scenes in Jahilia, and this is one of the things that made me uh, laugh out loud when I read it. Uh, where they go into the temple, um, Abu and... or no, I'm sorry, not Abu, Baal, and then the ruler of Jahilia, they go into the temple. And he says, Without warning, the grandee kicks the poet in the kidney. Attacked just when he has decided he's safe, Baal squeals, rolls over, and Abu Simbel follows him, continuing to kick. Runt, the grandee remarks, his voice remaining low and good-natured, high-voiced pimp with small testicles. And then, you know, it goes on a bit, and he says, Abruptly, Bale's tormentor squats down, grabs the poet by the hair, jerks his head up, and whispers into his ear, Bale, she wasn't the mistress I meant. The grandee's lips brush his ear. Shit of a frightened camel, Abu Simbel breathes. I know you fuck my wife. Um, <laughs> and that was one of the parts where I got to it and just, like, lost it. Um... Because you build up, this guy has been walking beside Bale and acting, you know, totally, uh, completely normal this whole time. Like nothing is amiss and then just snap, starts kicking him in the kidneys and then reveals that he knows that his wife is cheating on him with him. It's it's very, I, I don't really know how to say it. it it's, it, there, there's something in the incongruity of it that's funny. But but also th th there's something almost it's amusing because it's disturbing because of like the borderline sociopathy of this guy that he can hide his rage at this person who's having sex with his wife and then snap like that. I, I don't know. It's the incongruity, I guess, is what makes that scene. And I feel like a lot of his of Rushdie's sense of humor is ironic like that. It has to do with this uh, this incongruity between how people are feeling and how they're acting. Um, and, and that also comes across in the fact that a lot of his characters seem to be internally very confused. Like a, the big thing, that's another big thing in this book is crisis of identity. I feel a lot of these people don't even know who they are. And that's yep. a, that's a big thing. And again, with the crisis of identity, that feels autobiographical to me. I feel like, like Rushdie is, is, you know, talking about his Indianness clashing with what would be his newfound Britishness. And that this crisis of identity and all these stories about infidelity really come home to that. I would say also, though, that Jibril and Fari and Saladin are essentially Rushdie, like two halves of Rushdie. Because Jibril, is, Jibril himself is going through um, a loss of faith, which I think is the, the narrative reasoning behind his dreams. Um, because they're about... Did the dreams start things. only after he does the pork-eating incident? Yes. Okay. okay. So um, a lot of the, the dream sequences that Jabril goes through are a, a manifestation of his loss of faith. Um, and, I, I mean, it's kind of... Like, I do find loss of faith actually sad. There's a tragedy involved in that. And I think that the book actually captures that feeling very well because, um, and, and at times it's like, oh, you do something silly, like eat a bunch of pork because they told you you couldn't eat pork and you've lost your faith. So you just gorge yourself on right. pork. Uh, and then, and then you are sick because you've never had pork before and never, and it's not a smart idea to eat that much. And so since right. that night, he's been having these dreams and he doesn't want to sleep. Uh, he's plagued by this this loss of faith uh, throughout the book. Um, and uh, so to some extent, I think Jabril is also Salman Rushdie. And what he so to me, I feel like this novel is actually incredibly personal as opposed to incredibly um, uh, historical 
Like, <laughs> I feel like it's actually more personal than it is historical. Like, oh, I know that it has like this huge impact on the world uh, and especially the world of Islam. But I, I do think this is more about what's going on with Salman Rushdie at the time that he writes it than it does with anything else. Uh, because Christians have written novels about their loss of faith, you know, when they went through their crisis and uh, lost their, the only thing is, is that when a Christian writes a, a, an, a, a book about their journey into apostasy, no one tries to kill them. You know? I was going to say, I don't think, I don't think the Pope has issued a fatwa for that kind of thing since <laughs> exactly. maybe the Middle yeah. Ages. Yeah, it's been a yeah. while. I mean, yeah. I, I, I if we drop historical context, if we drop like the cultural reaction to this book and we just look at it from like, if you knew nothing about this book and you picked it up, I would, I would say that what you're saying is unquestionably true, Alex. Like it, this is a personal book about like personal journeys. This is not a book trying to make, actually really trying to make a statement about religion one way or another. It's just a personal journey book. Well, yeah, he's questioning things like, how easily does religion fall into cult? Like with the, the dreams about the, um, the pilgrimage uh, and yes. how far does a cult go like stoning a baby? Uh, and what, what are you willing to do to have that sense of community and faith? And um, what, what happens when you lose that? Do you become a better person or do you become a worse person? when you lose your ability to believe in something greater than yourself, um, that is religion. And, and I, I mean, so to me, uh, most of this book is, has nothing to do with trying to convert people to atheism. That is not at all what his goal is. It is more about his journey into trying to understand faith and the loss of faith. And, uh, but he was Muslim. So it is about, losing right. faith in islam and i don't i and i find it really kind of sad that the reaction is to be so vehemently yeah violent against him um just because he, like if he had written this and no one had ever read it like you know it wouldn't have been no one would care about what he had to say like it's it's very sad. Um, I think that the the cultural reaction was so violent because I do not think this was about. I want you all to lose faith in Islam. I don't think he he pushes that at all. Yeah. Right. And I th I would say in support of that, uh, I have a quote from him here in a 2006 interview with PBS. Rushdie called himself a hardline atheist in 1989 in an interview following the fatwa. Rushdie said that he was, in a sense, a lapsed Muslim, though shaped by Muslim culture more than any other and a student of Islam. So I think you're definitely right that this book is basically about Rushdie or more about what's going on with him. Um, and also, I, I think you're definitely right that he tells this in a tragic way. It's not like he's trying to make people atheists. And he, and as, all of the things he says about religion, when you look closely, are very sympathetic. It doesn't, at, at no point... You know, maybe he's critical, I guess, but he's he's never unsympathetically critical. You know, at, at no yeah. point do does he just devolve into vitriol or invective aimed at religion. There's no Dawkinsian new atheist type stuff going on here. Uh, you know, when he talks about um, Muhammad, his his sketch of Mahond or Muhammad, however you who you know, it's the same guy, mm -hmm. is, is sympathetic. He makes it. He does imply that Muhammad is making this stuff up or making the angel say things, but his, at the same time, his sketch of Muhammad, the way he depicts him, makes him look very sincere. It makes yeah. it seem like he actually wants to do the right thing. Yeah. And he also, he, he has this, this really great passage uh, toward the second half of the book. Uh, let me see if I, if I've got it here, uh, where he says, where um, he, he's in, we're inside of this woman's head. And one of the things that she says is, I, I, I can't find it, but one of the things that she says is, what you're willing to believe is based on what you've seen. And it, it's mm. sort of, I, I feel like in, by writing that, Rushdie is basically saying, this is kind of relative. 
you know, whether you are willing to believe in a religion or not largely hinges on what kind on the kinds of experiences that you've had. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, um, uh... Let's. I, can we talk about Aisha, the 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 lepidopteral Aisha, the the butterfly <laughs> one? Because that was one of the vignettes that I wanted to under like the Mahmoud stuff. I kind of we, okay, that's Muhammad. We kind of know what's going on. It kind of he come like that story kind of ends and it's okay. Um, her story ended. But because there was a Mercedes, in, like the Mahmoud stuff was old, and I'm like, okay, that's stuff that happened in the past. But there's a Mercedes in her story, which means it's not old, uh, it's contemporary. And I wasn't sure if I kind of expected some, uh, like Chumcha to run into when he went back to India to run into some evidence that that story was real, but I didn't. Am I the only one that expected that, or did I miss some evidence, or who cares? What, what? I think you're supposed. It's supposed to be more grounded in a reality that you know, as a way of showing that this kind of behavior still happens. This hmm. cultish behavior, like we, I mean, we we have real world examples of cults forming in our modern times and people doing insanely violent or self-destructive acts in the name of the cult. So I think that's why that's there. And then, and also it shows how easy it is for someone to feed off people's desperation because mm -hmm. one of the people uh, that is following her is dying of cancer. So this idea right. that you are looking for any kind of answer to save yourself um, and someone could come along and that's makes that state makes you vulnerable to this kind of manipulation. So I think it was more about making it clear that this is not, this behavior is not so old that it doesn't exist anymore. It absolutely still does exist and you still can fall prey to it. Um, that's why I think it was still a dream, but also modern, uh, is to display that we haven't gotten over this as humanity. <laughs> so how real were Farishta's dreams then? Because are we to take his dreams about Mahmoud seriously? Or is this just he just made some crap up and it's because he's struggling with his faith and that's all it is. It's a it's a struggle with his faith. I can't tell because of magical realism. I'm not used to it. So I'm like, is he dreaming what really happened? Or are we not supposed to think that at all? Are we supposed to think his dream is just his own thing there's the the magic realist level is everything that happens actually happened all right, all right. like you okay. take it as faith however this ha one does have a layer of its dream so it you make it makes you question the reality of it you're supposed to question the reality of it okay. um it's supposed he's undercutting the realism of those moments on purpose uh so and making it a direct correlation to his loss of faith to show you what causes a loss of faith and, and what thought journey you go through with a loss, loss, of, loss of faith. So like to me, okay. and also to some regard, I do think Rushdie is smart enough to know that if he maybe made it a dream, it would give him some cushion from- uh... Right, this is, this, is how, this is how an apostate dreams. I'm just showing you how they dream. Exactly. Right. Yeah. He's like, yeah. I'm not saying I support it, but but he, the thing is, though, is that he did go through his own apostate journey. So to them, they're going to assume that he supports it anyway. It doesn't matter. Yeah. He it, yeah. Honestly, like, whether or not he spoke, if he lived in a place that was um, uh, had apostasy laws, uh, whether or not he wrote this book, he would have been in trouble. So it did, like, to okay. me, I'm sort of like, it, I don't know that it would have mattered, honestly. Okay, which makes sense about why they wouldn't circle back and give us indication that the Aisha story was true or not, because you want it to be this dream and we don't know, just like we don't know whether the Mahmoud stories are true. Um, yeah. By the way, speaking of, we can combine funny with dreams right now, because one of the things that I loved, Caleb, you're saying there's a lot of spots that made you laugh. I loved Ball's uh, attack on... 
Mahmoud in the turning the whorehouse into his like ter- like having <laughs> each one represent a wife uh, uh, of Mahmoud. It was hilarious and uh, brilliant. And there was just there was a lot of little brilliant things where a character just comes up with something that's just deliciously sometimes mean and bad or evil or whatever, but like deliciously brilliant. I loved the whores. I loved them so much. And I, I, they, the whores are tragic comedy in this novel because, mm-hmm. like, they're so, they're, they're like pretty innocent when it comes to like what they do and think. And then, uh, and so when they do, when they are arrested and everything, it's like, I'm sad for them, even, even though that their, right. their behavior was hilarious. I so like I felt bad for them. Uh, Did they expect Paul to save them? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, they're so naive. It's uh, it's it's both sad and hilarious at the same time. Uh, there's a lot of tragic comedy in this book. <laughs> I will. I'm gonna read one of my other favorite things, um, which is all. This is probably also heretical. There's a point where, uh, wait. I don't even know who he's talking to. Hold on. Uh, oh, um, the Sarpanch's wife dies. Uh, this is in the. This is actually all in a dream, uh, but this is in Aisha's uh, pilgrimage, um, and the Sarpanch's wife gets this vision, and uh, the angel Azriel shows up. Azriel shows up, and. She asks, Jibril, she whispered, is it you? And he says, no, the apparition replied, it is I, Azriel, the one with the lousy job. Excuse the disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's just like, you have all these, uh, you have all these, uh, these fictionalized versions of death coming to take you. And, and sometimes death is mean and sometimes death is nice. But this is the first time where it's death is just like self-aware that like yeah my job sucks i'm sorry like uh, this is just he's just kind of funny <laughs> and he, he reminds me of like uh the robot in douglas adams who's just suicidal like like this i kind of hear that that at in death like i'm sorry to disappoint like my job suck i got the loud job um i don't know that was just an example that made me laugh out loud I, I'll admit, I both was uncomfortable laughing and uh, mad during uh, Chamcha's arrest se- sequence. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. It was infuriating. <laughs> it was infuriating, but it was also <laughs> yes. funny. And it was also... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was because he's turning into a devil. Like, <laughs> and, and they're like messing with his penis and it it's i don't know it's just it's so crazy and at the same time you're like why are you acting this way the cops and it's it's yeah. <laughs> it, it was like a weird mix it's like of hilarious emotion. brutalism in some way that like i don't understand <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. i'm really angry at you but boy you guys are funny yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's really weird mix of emotion in that scene but that, yes. that reminds me we haven't talked about the the cl- the culture clash that is a theme throughout because he's writing mm-hmm. about these people who are uh islamic living in england and the things that are going on with that like there's a lot going on there and even the dream sequence with Mahund is somewhat about a new cultural class because there's a, a growing culture yep. versus the old culture so like there's a lot of this going on and how it turns to violence. Like that you, that if a co- two cultures have two differing values and they exist in the same space, that violence is probably going to happen. Like it almost is it guaranteed throughout this novel that that's what's coming. Uh, whether or not it's a clean roundup of people or a riot, something's going to happen. That is a, a basically a use of force that is not justified uh but but is brought about by the fact that they cannot coexist with each other and i thought that was really interesting because i with how things are going now with a lot of people going well we have to all live together in harmony in the same space Mm. that it's like (laughs) i'm like worried about it this book makes me actually more worried (laughs) sure sure and it's not just like 
I mean, it's fundamentally, I mean, I don't know if this was his point, but it's, it's the, it's these deep religious beliefs about good and evil and about um, when you can use force against people that are just different. Right. And so uh, I, I viewed the, I viewed the Mahmoud uh, go, uh, moving to the town as like, it was like, like Vegas being invaded by Tehran. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was like, wow, that doesn't go well. Right. Like the people of Vegas think it's if the Ayatollah becomes the dictator of Vegas, it doesn't end well for anyone. Um, and uh, yeah, I I don't know a lot about the. I don't know a lot about the culture clash in the UK, but I did see clear parallels. I was actually thinking of the George Floyd stuff with the reaction to um, I, it's obviously it's not the same. Um, so, uh, but, you know, this guy gets arrested. I forget Uhuru, uh, I forget his last name, um, gets arrested for murders that he likely very didn't, didn't, didn't really commit probably. Well, we know later that he didn't commit them. Um, there's just a lot of, uh, bias against the culture. And I think they use the word blacks to mean packies and like anyone, Anyone who's not white in the UK, I think that's just a blanket term, which I didn't really realize. Um, but there's that, and there's a there's a point in which I think it's on page in my copy. It's on page four twenty nine, and Chumcha is annoyed at the language that they're using because he makes this point. You've got these these uh, people singing these songs that are, are like reminiscent of uh, American slaves suffered, they're like suffrage songs from like how American slaves suffered and whatever. And he's making this point that like, you guys don't have the same history. Like there wasn't a history of slavery in the UK and you guys didn't even be a part of that. You're kind of commandeering this tragedy from halfway around the globe. And he, one of the points he makes is he says, um, let's see. He also felt about the or uh, let's see. I think he also felt about the or organizer's decision to punctuate the speeches with such meaning loaded songs as "We Shall Overcome" and even for Pete's sake, uh, Nikosi Sikel's "I Africa," as if all causes were the same, all histories are interchangeable. Um, he had like I think he makes this really good point because he I saw in that scene where he's in this meeting house and having this reaction you see it in american culture today this like uh total conflation of all the oppressed have the exact same kind of uh not necessarily the same story but are able to capitalize on the same histories in order to get what they want even though their history might not be theirs does that make sense yes it's like a yeah, they're co-opting. Um, That's the word. Thank you. Yes, they're co-opting. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think that's common today. Even like I, I, you know, yeah, groups using other people's history as a way of like gaining one up, then you know, one up on their opponents and in. in a, a kind of cultural clash like I, I i could totally like we're just like these people and i mean and honestly i've seen a lot of when um socialists have done that a lot with um they don't they will say they will use a minority group as a way of uh pushing their agenda and so to me like and i i literally like ralph ellison that um writer actually was like warning people warning black people in america don't listen to red he is lying to you about his intent he just wants to use you essentially right. um and i so like i think not only is it sometimes a grassroots thing where it is the like maybe one or two people are like hey this is a good idea we can use this to you know push our uh our goals even if it doesn't matter, even if it doesn't apply. Uh, but I also think there that um, AstroTurf people will use it as a method of gaining followers. So it's, it you know, it's kind of a, a dual issue there. Um, I don't, uh, the AstroTurf example, I don't really think is in this novel, but the, definitely the co-option by <laughs> uh, yeah. 
the people is definitely there. Yeah. There has got- been a, a lot of cultural clash in the UK, um, even as far back as he wrote this, because they've always had a higher number of subcontinent populations moving there because of the um, when Britain was uh, in charge of India. Uh, so like uh, a, a lot of people would send their kids to be educated in England, and that still applies today. They still do that. Um, because it's become an, almost a tradition at this point. Uh, and there is a growing number of Muslims in the UK at this point. It's the second largest religion in the UK. Um, and the problem is now not that the UK is uh, seeing them as a danger. It's that they're making excuses for them for fear of being called racist. Um, when they, yeah. when a member of their community does do something illegal, such as the grooming gang issue, uh, that well, was, Sadiq Khan uh, is 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 the is the mayor now. Is he still the mayor? I believe so. Yes. Right. I mean, so we have a Muslim mayor in London now, and there, you're right. There's a lot of cover up of, um, basically, if if crimes are being committed uh, disproportionately by immigrants, we're not allowed to talk about it. I mean, and that's not you, the UK is not the only one suffering under that um, uh, concept. Now, uh, a lot of countries are doing that. Um, Sweden being one of them. Uh, Germany's done it. I think Canada has done it. Uh, and I, I don't honestly. I find that to be as racist as assuming they're <laughs> bad people. <laughs> like I'm like, is equally as racist to do the that. Um, <laughs> To, to go, oh, well, they have different values, so they can't, they can't assimilate to our laws. That's a, that's also not, uh, that, that's assuming that they're like children. That's how I picture that. Like, oh, well, they don't know any better is essentially what you're saying. And I, and I don't, yeah. it's like, it's, it's a law on your books, hold them accountable for it. Like, <laughs> like you would anyone else that's right. not treating them differently would be less racist than giving them a pass. Uh, and, and that's not to say that every Muslim in every uh, non majorly non-Muslim uh, country is committing crimes. It's just that uh, there's been a policy to just turn a blind eye when they do in a lot of these countries. And I, I do think that is an absolute mistake that is not going to help people live alongside each other peaceably. <laughs> no, no, uh, it, it causes resentment upon among the native population and it probably increases pr- crime. It gives the, the mm-hmm. criminals and it gets more power because they don't get yep. prosecuted. So um, it actually is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's 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 creating what they're wanting to ignore. Yep. Like, oh, we don't want people to think it's 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 uh, a problem in this community. I'm like, well, you're going to make it a problem in that community if you only ignore it when it happens in that community. <laughs> like, that's how it grows. That's how it grows yeah. into a problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and to some extent, I do think it's a failure to those communities um, for the governments to not hold them to the same standards because some of the people have moved there specifically because they like the country's laws and policies and to then not apply them equally to their community is kind of a betrayal. Uh, You know, it's like they might as well be living where they were before uh, (laughs) because you're not following the promises you made uh, as a government. So, I, I mean, I, I, it's a very complex issue and it's definitely the, the standard practice right now of basically turning a blind eye. It has so many impacts and problems for, and issues towards everyone. Like everyone is, is affected negatively by this. Um, there's no real benefit for turning a blind eye to crime like that. Yeah. Do you, I just want to, I'm going to maybe switch subjects a little bit, but we get to the end. I'm trying to not give stuff away. <laughs> um, I, 
I think it's partly portrayed that that Saladin Chumcha has kind of one final thing, and then he's gonna be able to. I don't want to say relax, but like not be haunted in some way. And this, the final thing happens. But that's not clear to me that he's going to remain unhaunted because I'm like, how much responsibility does he have for the final thing? And won't that irk him? I I think that there was that essentially like there's this idea that one um, that because of because of the, the false dual nature of these, you know, one as evil, one as good was presented to us the idea is that one of them has to die um that mm. to, or be destroyed uh and there is a lot of back and forth on how that is going to happen who's going to be the one to go uh how you know is it going to be involved where one of them does it to the other one there's there's so many twists and turns in that regard um at one point jabriel is trying to kill saladin uh, right. you know <laughs> and then he instead instead saves him because the, the, the whole point is that it's all that that dual nature that one is a villain and one is a hero is bullshit um the reality is is that both of these are man versus self it's just two men versus self uh right. so, so um but they have an impact on each other they can't go without impacting one another so uh even if you would feel like, oh, maybe this will be it and I'll feel comfortable now. Uh, and, and then the, the truth is that life doesn't work that way. Uh, right. And it will continue to throw things at you even unto the last second. And um, so this and also by one by by the idea of self-destruction being involved in not that takes out the idea of good versus evil. Self-destruction is not about good versus evil of two adversaries. It is right. a, it is about fighting your inner demons. So to me, yeah. I think a lot of that all builds to this idea that that's all bullshit. Like we, the idea that you know there's good people and there's bad bad people, you know, and we cast them as such. That's not true, and that's not human beings are way more complex than that. And I, I really appreciate that as a theme um, because I do think it's too easy to cast people as good and evil, uh, like the people that we see in our lives and, you know, mm -hmm. on TV and stuff. And then I think that's actually kind of an important aspect of this is that they're both actors. So they're both mm -hmm. somewhat famous. So pe how people perceive them is highly important to, um, to that thematic that theme so i i think on, on the subject of this being man versus self except it's two men versus the same self which is pretty astute um th there's a particular passage where they're talking about maybe since you're turning into a devil we should call a priest and have them ex exorcise you <laughs> and it's just this is a. Uh, this is one of the places that made me laugh really hard, but in retrospect, I think it's pretty meaningful with regards to Rushdie's atheism, and that plays into the man versus self thing, because it goes like this. He ascended to the attic and suggested to Saladin that the girls might not have been so wrong, that perhaps the possession of his body could be terminated by the intercession of a mullah. At the mention of a priest, Chamsha reared up on his feet raising both arms above his head, and somehow or other the room filled up with dense and sulfurous smoke while a high-pitched vibrato screech with a kind of tearing quality pierced Sufyan's hearing like a spike. The smoke cleared quickly enough because Chamcha flung open a window and fanned feverishly at the fumes while apologizing to Sufyan in tones of acute embarrassment. I really can't say what came over me, but at times I fear I am changing into something... something one must call bad. So... What I think is interesting there is this is sort of Rushdie almost turn it, almost completing his uh, transformation into an atheist, right? Because he's at the point where even someone mentioning a mullah will make him scream at the top of his lungs, and it, and I, I almost want to say that this is sort of if I can be presumptuous enough to step inside of Rushdie's head for a second, this is how the pious part of him views what is going on is like he's a demon that screams when it sees a crucifix, or a crescent is the case, maybe. Um, 
So, so I, I, I think that, and, 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 it, and it seems to question, like, if that's what's going on with the devil side of him, then what is Jibreel in this? Mm-hmm. You know, what is, is he sort of the, the part that's pretending to still be pious? Like, you know, what's going on there? Would you, I think, um, so a lot of this whole good versus bad while going through apostasy at the same time is about um, a lot of people of faith when they lose their faith, they question how you become a good person when you do not have faith. Um, So they see this as a turning point between uh, their two different moral goals, evil or good. um, And they don't understand how to um, function like that without the guide of religion. The problem is, is that, (laughs) and I think it's something Rushdie realized is that that's that's not true. You can be good and evil and uh, not have faith. So those were or have or faith. have faith. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he realizes that. So this whole idea that um, why they're splitting off into good and evil, uh, but they're not really. Uh, but they have to meet somewhere in the middle. In, in what is actual human beings, which is, you know, both good and evil within the same body, but without faith to guide you. So how do you make choices about what is good and what is uh, bad when you don't have faith? And he asked, that's the, the, the crux of apostasy. Now, I never went through apostasy. I literally have been atheist my whole life. So like, understand that from my perspective, this is just what I understand of listening to a lot of people talk about going through apostasy. Well, I have, and I, (laughs) and I can say, and it was a big deal. Um, And actually at the beginning of the show, you said, I understand if you don't want to read it because it could, it could upset your religious uh, beliefs or whatever it could be. I, um, I remember in my early twenties, I definitely was avoiding books that because I had been taught, don't read anything that contradicts the word of God. Obviously, I wasn't Muslim. I was, I was Christian. Um, and so I was avoiding I was avoiding reading anything that I thought might uh, shake my faith. Um, I, obviously, I didn't avoid that forever. But um, I, I will say one of the I'll, – I'll make, I'll make two comments about going through it because it's a huge – I mean, I, when you actually have faith, not just when you're like a – you know, go to church on, on Easter and, and Christmas Eve Christian. But when you're actually deep, I was deep in it. When you're actually deep and you really believe and you really have faith and you're really trying to use it to live your life, it is um, quite shattering to lose it. And um, I think two, two things happen. One is there is this struggle, like you're saying of like, well, how do I, how do I, how do I know what's good and evil now? How do I like? How do I make this decision? And you know, and and it's tough. People are people would argue with me. Well, you should go back to being Christian. And it's like, well, now once you're outside of going, when once you're outside of the faith, you come to this realization that if I go back to being Christian, that's still me choosing what's good and evil because I know what that menu item is. So even if I go choose a religion, I'm choosing between menu items of what's good and evil. It's still coming from me. And that there's this like horrible realization that like, oh my God, it, it's no pun intended or no, uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to ironic. Like, oh, it's up to me. It's up to me. And that's scary. Um, and But I will say the other thing that happens is there is a period of – um, there is a period of overreaction, uh, which which I think you see a lot with the new atheist movement. There's a period of overreaction in in which you're determined to fight the thing that you felt trapped by. You felt like you were you were trapped. There are these captors, and you've got to fight this thing. And I see that in Saladam Chumcha here a little bit, where there's this like. He has this visceral reaction, and and obviously that goes away. Like he he, there's this kind of culmination moment where he lets it all out, and then it's over. And now he doesn't need to fight it anymore. And actually, he can coexist with with 
religion and, or, and other stuff and it's not a it's not a problem and i definitely had that experience where i i had to go through this um sort of catharsis of okay i have to go harm my jailers uh and you know that doesn't actually help and and whatever but like you you end up on the other side of it going I don't have to harm my jailers. Like that's fine. like I just disagree. They're like, not my like jailers I'm, anymore. I've moved on. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've moved on, and uh, and I, I that seems that metaphor worked for me with with Saladin. It's I, very different when you're raised atheist because like I have a very sedate attitude about religion, like incredibly sedate. There's there was no point at. at in fact, I actually was like, well, maybe I should go to church. And I went for a couple of years and I was like, you know, what? this isn't for me. It was such a, yes. <laughs> it was not like, there's no great big reveal or anything. I'm just like, you know what? I don't believe I'm not, I'm not going to keep going to church. Like it was so casual. And that comes from growing up in an irreligious household completely. So like, uh, it's a, it's a very different experience and it's probably why the new atheists never, they're like, vehemence never was attractive to me because i was i don't i don't have that experience i don't have this experience of having been jailed at all <laughs> you know it didn't yeah. happen to me <laughs> i have a lot of friends like you though who grew up i don't know about caleb but i have a lot of friends like you who grew up like that and they don't they never went through that same thing caleb but what's your background no i i, I was raised by crazy uh, pentecostals um church every sunday kind of a thing um and one thing that I have noticed is that the people I've met who are the most hostile to religion grew up in a religious household. Congenitally atheist people are the only ones I've met that have a hostility to religion are the ones who, who had a parent who grew up in a religious household and has like, oh, that's the churchy side of the family. We don't talk to them kind of a thing. Uh, mm. and, and one thing that I, that I find interesting is that a lot of people who go through apostasy have this cycle like you, Carter, where they start off they begin by being very, very hostile toward religion and being almost evangelically anti-theist. And then by the time then they get older and they just kind of cool off, they just go, eh, whatever, you do you. And I have noticed this, I think, especially as people get older, it, not in every case, obviously, but as people get older, one thing I notice is they do tend to move toward religion. People who are religious become more religious when they get old. People who are in the middle kind of develop some spiritual feelings sometimes, and people who are hostile to it a lot of the time will cool off. And I notice this happens, it starts to, or at least in my friend group, I noticed this starting to intensify around, uh, around the age of 30 or so. As people move into middle age, they, they start to have a more cordial attitude toward religion. Um, the cynical Is that part true of with everything, it's... though? Because I, I, think, I think you're talking about a general, like— any kind of fervent belief or activism does tend to mellow out when people get older with just about anything, whether it's pro-religion, anti-religion. It's just like, eh, I'm, I'm older and I'm not going to get so easily worked up. Well, I mean, I think part of that, like, first of all, you have less energy once you're in your 30s. And then there's a point where your hormones kind of level out. And that also, like, and that's usually in your 40s or 50s. Uh, so like the, you will even see people who suffer from mood disorders level out in their forties and fifties as their hormones level out. Uh, neuroticism so like, tends to decrease the trait neuroticism drops as a person goes into middle age. Oh, really? yeah. Yes. So like hor hormones have a huge impact on, uh, mood. Uh, like it, and I, I, I always find that really funny because, um, a lot of people think that, oh, it's, it's. Like when it comes to psychology, they're like, this is stasis and this is going to be how it is until you freaking die in your 70s. And, and science doesn't really back that up. The, like the numbers and number of episodes doesn't really back that up. And for them, there are people that there are exceptions, you know, that pe some people stay vehemently, you know, uh, about some ideology their whole lives. Uh, honestly, though, when it's someone in their like sixties and seventies and they're very vehement about an ideology, I don't trust them. Like I have a cynicism over there. It their feels immature. Yeah, like it's either it's like a sense of immaturity or maybe a, a a cynical questioning of their actual intentions. 
Uh, like I don't trust. Right. Is it that they're is being it honest. their actual belief that's the bothersome part, or is it the? Because I'm not sure whether I've mellowed out in terms of. I don't know how much I've mellowed out in terms of what I fundamentally think, but I've definitely mellowed out in terms of my expression of it. Right? Like I don't. I might think very similar things about many religions and and religious ideas, but I don't express. I don't. I don't need to go argue and yell about it and make it a, a central part of my life anymore. <laughs> is it the, for old people, for you, is it the expression that's bothersome or or the certainty of the belief itself? It's the expression. If their expression is uh, is as extreme and as active uh, mm -hmm. as someone in their 20s, that's when I question it. If the like your beliefs stay the same from your twenties to your seventies, but your behavior doesn't mellow, that's where I start going. I don't know that I trust you. You know, <laughs> right. Right. that's where I'm at. Right. <laughs> it, it it feels like I, I think I know I'm harping on this angle, but it feels like if someone when someone is like that, it seems like arrested development, which strictly speaking, it is. And if someone's development is arrested, that immediately leads the, the, the immediate next question is, well, what's wrong with them? Like, what is your deal that you have to still be this way? What stopped this from changing? I mean, it's an indication that introspection hasn't taken place, which means personal growth hasn't taken place, uh, which which can open up a Pandora's box of questions about everything else. I feel that way about people who have not gotten past the perspective of um, the spotlight theory, wh where wherein you think everyone's looking at you and judging you and their perceptions of you are highly valued, which is what you go through as a teenager, that sort of narciss mm. narcissism and neuroticism at the same time. Like, I've seen people in their 40s and 50s who still act like that who worry so much about perception of themselves. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, I tend not to take most of what they say seriously because of that, because they are valuing more than their principles, how other people view them. And so I have a really hard time trusting them uh, at all. Uh, and, and you can sometimes pick up on that. Like, I feel like often Bill Maher is like that, honestly, that he has that every, like, which makes sense to the perspective that he's on TV. Like TV show hosts are more likely to, and celebrities are more likely to have that problem, I would say. <laughs> G-Man's asking a question in chat related to this, and I want to clarify. He, he says, so maintaining passion is arrested development. That's not how I meant it, but maybe it's how you guys meant it what's the difference between like, is there a healthy main maintenance of passion yes i i, I, mean, I, I want to i want to say it's arrested development in the very strict like semantic sense of that word in that the development has stopped it hasn't changed that's sort of a definition thing but it has a but negative not necessarily dysfunctional is what you're saying right right okay but strictly speaking okay. yeah you stopped changing therefore you are not your development has been arrested i see I see. But okay, I, I would, I would just remove the negative connotation from that for it because it doesn't necessarily you don't necessarily need to. I think passion is good, right? Like I, I, I don't I'm not bothered by an old person who's passionate. I, for me, it's the focus of their passion, right? Whether it's whether it's still um, I need to tear down this other thing constantly, or uh, whether they're passionate about their family and their kids and their grandkids and uh, doing positive things. Like those are different passions than uh, still in the lashing out phase. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's sort of like if I see someone in their sixties, like at a protest that and shouting burn down buildings, I, that's the person I'm like, I don't trust your intention here. Like, you know, right. uh, like literally you just forgive that, them when they're 20 but not when they're 60 is that the, the it's like well you're an like, idiot you know, when they're 20 i think they honestly yeah. mean it when they're when they're 60 i think their intention is actually something else oh yes. you don't think they could possibly mean it having life experience that long they can't possibly mean that unless they're morons so well it's yeah. like somebody morons who's playing in a rock band 
at the age of 50. Like James Hetfield is still in Metallica. He's in like his 60s or 70s. He still has to pretend to be pissed off all the time because that's how he makes money. Mm. You know, if so, if you're like a new atheist person and you need speaking engagements and and, uh, you know, playing tickets to fancy places to go talk to crowds of people and tell them religious people are dumb. Well, you you have to uh, you have to you have to get to keep yourself fired up somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Like okay. it, it's money or power to me when you're older and you're pushing violence or uh, extreme action. I, I don't think you actually care whether or not like violence happens. I think you just want power or money. Those are my like, because at that point, uh, especially like a lot of the people who end up proselytizing that hardcore into their older, old age and, um, and, pushing for extreme action from others, uh, they're, they're already usually rich at that point, like a lot of them. And like being rich and powerful begets wanting more money and more power. So that's where I come from on looking at those people as being inauthentic in their uh, proselytizing. Uh, and that, that applies to any political or religious ideology behavior like it could be anyone if they're pushing that passionately at that age i and especially for extreme action that's where i'm like mm, i'm not sure that i trust your actual intention here so let me look can we sense. loop it back to the book for a sec yeah yes. i do and now but i'm now going to bring it back to uh, uh a younger person in the book i'm going to bring it back to aisha because i'm fascinated with the butterflies and um was she authentic She was a hard character to um <laughs> Caleb has an opinion. Caleb's just making the crazy sign. All right. Yeah. Uh like I felt like she was actually a dense character, like purposely impenetrable at times. Uh from a writing perspective, I felt like she mm -hmm. was it, like the the goal was to make her the mystique. Uh, cult leader which is and hard to gauge like is she in is this her actual intention does she actually believe these things or is she cynical at that times i thought she was more on the cynical side because like oh you know i will fly you there says the the rich man in right. mercedes and um you know that that way like because if nothing happens when you get to the beach like you're in trouble and um and so she like prays overnight about it. And then she comes back and she says, oh, no, we're going to keep going. At that point, I but was she like. she says yes to him first. Where yeah, I was she like, does. Oh, she's, yeah, that, she's revealed. I, but then she I, doesn't. Yeah. And then she doesn't. And I and I think like on further examination, she realized that, oh, they'll kill me if I come back after I fly there or something like that. Like I felt that's the moment where I felt like maybe there was some cynicism involved. I felt like she I, I felt like there was perhaps a statement about uh, those types of, of leaders, uh, which is that they are fundamentally misanthropic in the sense that like they um, they choose death uh, over disgrace. Like she would rather, die and kill everyone in the town then be exposed to them as a fraud yeah i mean i i think we can say that she was not a good person like legitimately not mm -hmm. a good person because of the stoning of the baby like i'm like oh, yeah, yeah. I, I can't like after that moment like no whether or not her intention was authentic or cynical I am like, she's not a good person either way. Like, right. and I think that's on purpose. Honestly, I do that this idea that, okay, it doesn't, does it matter if she's authentic or cynical? Because she actually, her acts are right. We know she's bad. Yes. Or she's do making, she's making bad choices or whatever. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <sighs> I think, um, one thing about Aisha, there, there's one part, one thing that I think is really interesting is 
when she diagnoses the woman's cancer, her breast cancer, and there's skepticism there. And then it turns out she's right. And it's just funny because given who Salman Rushdie is and what he's writing about, you expect it to turn out false, but he totally throws you a curveball, which I actually kind of mm -hmm. loved. Um, that it's just really interesting that he sets up that expectation and just completely pulls the rug out from under it, I think. Uh, well, there's also, there's questions about whether Aisha actually does have some sort of divine connection. Whether or not she's good or evil is a separate issue, but I mean the that the breast cancer thing is is the is the hook to like oh maybe there's something to this character because she there you know it could just be that it's luck but it, there's something to this but then the butterfly stuff is just bizarre um and kind of inexplicable and I feel like you know there's an association between psychoticism and uh religion in a lot of societies right so for example in a lot of primitive cultures the shaman is the crazy guy you know when mm. someone is when someone's acting loony back in ancient greece they the the reaction was just to pawn it off and go oh whatever zeus is getting up in him again uh oh it so, must be so, a god speaking through him because he makes no sense to us right right okay which, in a sense, if I, I okay, I'm, I'm. This is kind of an aside, but it almost seems like in that case, making people into oracles and prophets is a way of basically creating a social role for people with mental issues. Um, kind of interesting. And uh, l lest lest anyone get the wrong impression, I was actually late here because the traffic was a little bit heavy getting back from church. So don't think that I'm trying to. Uh, I'm not. I'm actually not trying to make you an atheist. <laughs> but it was a satanic church, Caleb. Uh, metal no um but i'm kidding anyway, it was a satanic church people <laughs> but it, it, anyway i i, I wanted to say so in, in that case in the case of her eating the butterflies my thought is okay she's like a shaman type lady she's nuts people are ascribing some divine supernatural significance to her uh based on her doing crazy shit she sits there and eats butterflies all day, squatting there in a sari like a... I mean, if you see someone squatting down and eating insects, that sounds like a crazy person, right? In that movie, The Exorcism of uh, Emily Rose, that that's one of the things they have her do is she's possessed or crazy. It's kind of ambiguous on that front. And she starts eating roaches and stuff. Uh, yep. And I guess that means that we're all nuts because soon we'll all be eating the cricket flower. Uh, <laughs> oh, hell no. <laughs> I will not eat but the But it's bugs, not just no. her eating them, right? It's the, it's their reaction to her, right? Like they clothe her. That's, they follow yeah. her around. They Like there's something there that's not just – that makes you question, well, is, this, is there supposed to be something supernatural? Is, does, she, does she have a connection to the supernatural? Because it certainly seems like – there's something there. I mean, I think it's supposed to be somewhat ambiguous. I don't think it's supposed to be like an obvious thing. The problem is, is that their reaction to it is so extreme and negative. The impact from it, like whether or not you like, okay, I believe this person is a, you know, a prophet from God. That's okay. That's, you know, all right. But don't, stone a baby to death because you believe this person is a prophet right. from god <laughs> right. well and <laughs> interestingly the villagers didn't that. right the yeah. villagers didn't the followers um, did <laughs> right an interesting thing about the followers one thing that i found uh again this was funny but also uh like delicious in some way um so uh Saeed confronts her. Oh, you talked to, to Jibril. Yes, I talked to the angel. Okay, great. Well, like, how does he speak to you? And he decides to, like, force her to be more specific. <laughs> and the thing, after everything, he's followed her. You know, he's followed her in his Mercedes for, I don't know, weeks and weeks and weeks. He's been trying to convince people. No one will, like, no one's getting convinced. And finally, he said, this is, is this after the baby stoning? I think it's after the baby stoning. It's when everyone's like, you know, what the hell just happened? The way he undoes her is he just put pushes on this. And she finally says, the archangel sings to me, she admitted, to the tunes of popular hit songs. <laughs> and everyone just bursts out laughing. 
And that, to me, I mean, I thought it was hilarious. Uh, everyone bursts out laughing. And you think at that moment, she's lost all of her followers. It's over. Like, they're laughing at her. They realize the ridiculousness of this. And then the thing that's just tragic is they, they I don't think they believe anymore. They follow out of saving face. They kill themselves to save face, I think. Well, and also uh, because this is kind of an important part is that like a lot, what they were all in it together. There's this, what, human beings are social creatures and religion and cults play on that hardcore. And if mm -hmm. you feel a danger of a loss of community, which is a essentially an evolutionary impulse to have a, a, a community around you. And if you feel like that's going to go away, there is a self-destructive response to that. Like, you know, because how mm -hmm. do you survive without that community at this point? And especially one as tight and as together as that one, as a cult can become. Right, so it's, right. and, and so like, if you all agree to self-destruct at the same time, well, then you never actually had to experience that loss. And uh, I think that's like a really important part there is that it's not about belief at that point. It's about that making sure that community survives into an end, even if that end is deliberately chosen. It's like those heaven gate cults or whatever in which they, they predict the end of the world. They've sold all their possessions. They're living in a compound somewhere together, waiting for the comets to come by and scoop them all up and nothing happens. The end of the world doesn't happen. It goes by. You would think, oh, that's the end of this cult. Uh, and sometimes a few people leave after that, but actually many people just stay. And like it's, it's they redouble down on their beliefs. Um, so I, I guess I, I can see it as similar. It's just in the book, uh, he really puts you in the in the mode of like, oh, they he broke her. It's over. Like they know because deep down, all the villagers know she's full of shit at this point. They all know there's no faith anymore, but there's still the the behavior. Well, I I honestly think that sense of community is a stronger impulse than even faith. Mm. Uh, so a lot of people, when they leave a faith, that one of the things that they suffer is the, the loss of the community. Um, and I think that's actually why secularism is forming uh, ideologies, because ideologies are, are a way of forming communities and mm -hmm. um, policing those communities as well. And I, it's that feeling of community is so imperative in humans that mm -hmm. uh, they'll do anything for it. And it, it, yeah. it and and most people don't even realize that that's what's one of their driving forces is to have a community around them. And it's um, it's uh, it's honestly very sad when, yes, a cult or something uses that sense of community to make them do terrible things. It's like cancel mobs now. Right. Like they, they are a community. Um, maybe they're defined in an inverse way, which is a hatred of a particular thing or they've piling, piling on a bandwagon. But it's to, it's the, the idea is to um to get this sense of of belonging with others and to be part of the thing uh i think, well, you're, I mean, I think I, you're spot on that's one of the reasons why trans ideology right now the gender ideology and transition is happening a lot with teenagers is because it makes them part of a community that they mm -hmm. identify with and a lot of right. detrans talk about the idea that when they detrans they lose that and that all yep. that adoration goes away uh and mm -hmm. that that well, the, honestly, that is one of the bigger, I think, in, reasons why they're trans in the first place, why they choose it in the first place is because it gives them that community. Not necessarily because it's like, I think that's the deepest impulse that they're all feeling, whatever the other reasons why they transitioned were, uh, like sexual abuse or the fact mm. that they're gay and they're in a homophobic household or something like that. I think that sense of community is way is the the underlying impulse for all of them uh and it and it's and they do talk about that loss when they teach trans and huh. yeah it's like a more uh a more progressive version of of why kids won't uh you know join gangs right yes uh, they, and, you don't join, join gangs because you like murdering and stealing 
you join because you want to be part of the community and you need to be part of a community because you're in an environment in which if you're not part of that community, uh, life is hell. So, yeah. you know, and I think maybe a lot of kids feel that way um, now in, in a more suburban kind of setting where, <laughs> oh, I need to be part of this community. That's how I get protection, okay. love and and. Uh, I think there's a reason why a lot of trans kids these days are white predominantly is because maybe white people, like teenagers and kids, don't feel like they have a sense of community at all. Because, mm. yeah. uh, um, like, I, it seems like uh, there's an assault on the idea of being um, part of a white community. Like, it's not you. You're not allowed. You're not allowed a Christian community, oh, you know, from right. the progressive side either. So uh, you have to build your own community. And there's a ready-made one over here that just asks that you, you know, take puberty blockers. It's really right. terrible. Yeah. And it, it depends on how toxic some of these things are. Like if a kid in the 1990s or 2000s got into straight edge culture for a few years, that probably wasn't going to hurt them. Uh, you know, if, if your if your sense of belonging comes from wearing spiked denim jackets and not doing any drugs, well, OK. Uh, right. But but the, the thing is, is these uh, this sort of sense of belonging, a lot of these subcultures that give it to you. I, I don't know if I would really call them cults necessarily because they're not centralized enough, but they're they're definitely cult ish. And I, that includes things like a uh, subculture centered around having an eating disorder, the pro Anna stuff, which has mm -hmm. a huge overlap with the uh, with with the online trans community um mm -hmm. and also uh also the other thing i was thinking of was and, and this one's really controversial but do you do you know who the spoonies are that these people with chronic illnesses oh, uh who I've talk about yes like i have so many spoons that i can use to get certain things done mm -hmm. um well there, I, I read an article, an interesting article on Twitter that got ratioed to hell and back, which in retrospect was kind of obvious that, that would happen, uh, about a, a girl who was suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome or something similar. And this turned out to be psychosomatic mm -hmm. because it went away when her parents cut her off from the Spoonie community. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think we could talk about this kind of stuff all day, but I want to before we I think we should wrap up soon. <laughs> um, because we've been going for almost two hours. I just wanted to check with each of you. Are there any other parts in the book or points about the book that you think we, we need to, to discuss before we call it a day? Mm. Or that you I want think... to discuss? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw one thing out there. I'll throw one thing out there in the, um, in the scene, one of the ways he describes the violence that happened when, uh, I forget the guy's name, well, died in jail. Mm -hmm. um, he describes it from the perspective of a camera. And in like what's on the news and like, oh, the camera sees this and then the camera sees that and then the camera sees this. And he makes a point at the end of this, this description about what the camera's seeing, he makes a point that the camera chooses sides. Uh, and it, it really reminded me of Marcuse's argument actually in repressive tolerance that like there is a kind of mainstream narrative, like the, the, that, that there's sides to this mainstream narrative. And, and, and in the case of the Salman Rushdie, uh, description here, he's talking about, well, what the news, the news, for example, isn't reporting what's going on in the community, uh, inside that club. I forget the name of the club even, right? They're, they're, not, they're not talking about what's going, they can't see, they don't have that visibility. They only have the vis visibility from the outside perspective and with the police and the stuff that's happening. They're only seeing one side of the story. And it made me think about um, this, which is, it sounds trite to say, but I don't think we've actually figured out how everyone having a camera in their hands really will actually change that because uh, we see all the sides, but now we don't know what side now, like correlating, it's it's nice. It's clean. It was clean in the '80s to get a narrative based around well, the camera chooses sides, and that's the side. <laughs> you're on the side of the camera because that's the side you see. And now there's uh, all of the sides present. Well, 
you have a sense that all the sides are present, but not everything is recorded. So you still might be missing stuff. Um, and, and sorting through that is much messier. And I, I was, it made me start to think about what the cultural implications of that will be. And, and I know that's, a, again, it's a trite thing to say and think about because people talk about it all the time. But he reminded me of how much things have changed since he wrote this book and where we are now. And, and I don't know how you would write that scene now. And I'm not sure exactly uh, what the dynamics would be. That's all. Yeah. I mean, I think there is starting to be more literature that is covering that idea because we're practically in the pan off to con at this point. Um, mm. But it's really, um, I, 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 it is kind of hard to say, like, how would things in the past be different? Um, you know, like there, there's been literally accounts that talk like what would happen if Jesus had a Facebook account or what, what would the situation like people literally explore these ideas like what would happen if you know and because it's like it's interesting to think of the historical implications of things when you know with different technology because technology does change things but i think it doesn't change things as much as people like to think my that's my opinion hmm. because i think it speeds things up it speeds up humans actions but I don't think it changes what human impulses. Uh, so for example, pro Anna stuff existed before the internet existed. So like they, they already like, they feel form communities at their schools, you know, uh, and like, Oh, it expanded with, with the internet, but like, and then also cancel culture existed before the internet. Scientists literally had campaigns against each other before the internet was ever a thing with false allegations about their theories. That was already a thing. We've just sped up the process and access to the process. That's what I see as uh, going on with technology, with phones and with uh, you know social media and all that stuff. I just see a speed up. I, I think you're, I would say 95% correct that it's just a speed <laughs> up, but the, the part where I, the 5% that I'm unsure of is because humans have such, well, most people have such short memories in, in terms of like they don't they don't talk about events that happened, you know, a year ago or last week. Like, well, it's in the news cycle. It's not in the news cycle. They forget really, really quickly um, that that time window means that speeding up the cycle does have an effect on how reaction happens, because things that weren't in the window before are now in the window of memory. And like you can have a, a switch. Uh, you can have a behavioral impact, and I, I wonder if that, um, for better or worse, I'm, I wonder if that means something in terms of behavior. I don't know what it means, but but there is that, like, if people had infinite memories, I would agree, well, now you're just speeding it up. They couldn't communicate as fast, and it took a while. But now it's like, well, but they forgot all the old stuff. So maybe things will happen now that wouldn't have happened before at all, and those things might be bad or good. I'm not sure. Well, what I have noticed, though, is that uh, not my generation, not uh, but younger Zoomers um, are starting to reject a lot of technology that we consider absolutely important to us. Social like media, cell phones. They are pushing mm -hmm. back on over-reliance on technology because oh, they're not. Great. It, it, I know it's good news, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, and, and they're also pushing back on the idea of free love as well. Like, you know, hmm. which it was uh, facilitated by things like Tinder, you know, mm -hmm. te yep. tech made yep. that faster. So like they're pushing oh, yeah. back tech on made these it ideas. way easier, yeah. <laughs> way, yeah. way easier, but they're right. pushing back on these things because they're starting to recognize that to some extent that I'm not enjoying this. It's so hollow. like, yeah. yeah. So they there yeah. and I think that's good news. I really do. Um, because that's the thing is that the assumption often with new technology is that it is permanent and how it changes us is going to be permanent. But human beings still have their natural inclinations, their natural impulses that may not be permanently, you know, affected by new tech. They may in fact brush up against new tech and go, eh, not for me. Uh, so I, I think that's kind of an important thing to note is that like we often have this um, this bias to think that new tech is permanently changing humanity. And I don't.
buy that necessarily. Like it is, I think millennials, especially, which I am a member of, have an over-reliance on tech more than probably boomers or Gen Xers. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have we are the ones that grew up at the same time as the internet grew up. So for us, it was expanding and expanding while we were getting older and coming into our adulthood. So our reliance on tech is probably pretty high, um, and our integration with it is pretty high. But I don't see that trend as continuing for Zoomers. Someday you and I are going to sit down and have a talk about transhumanism and all of that, Alex, because it's fascinating. It's just not related to the... I no, think, it's not. Yeah, <laughs> we, we should stop it now because it's not part of book club. Uh, Caleb, no. anything else about the satanic verses that uh, that you want to say before we wrap it up? Uh, I, I think this is a good pick. It's very topical. Um, one of the best things about book clubs in general is the fact that they make me read things I otherwise wouldn't read. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's really nice to have somebody else pick the book because they always pick something I wouldn't pick. Uh, and I think uh, I, I, I think that if you're at all interested in the Islamic world and its relationship to the West, this, in a sense, can be treated as ethnography hmm. uh, be, or or an or an auto ethnography to use the phrase that's popular now. Except instead of a the story about doing weird performance art. It's actually a really, really introspective, good piece of work. Uh, so yeah, I did not much else to say other than that. I like the book. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining Caleb and Alex. Thank you. Alex is, uh, did you pick the book or did we mutually pick it? I was going to, we uh, kind give of you mutually, blame slash, yeah, but I pushed it. I, I did. <laughs> it, 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 well, I mean, I picked, I wanted to do it because it was culturally relevant and like Caleb, like you're saying, I would never have read this book in a million. It was not something that was on my radar. But it was, I was literally like, oh. on my next list for magicalism. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it, it was easy for Alex. But for me, I was like, I would never have read this. But but I knew it was culturally, culturally relevant. And it was one of those books that uh, I felt like it would be – I would be a better person. F like I would fit better in – I would understand the cultural references. And it would be something like it's, it's culturally important to know. Um, and so that was one of the reasons that I, I wanted, but, uh, thank you all for joining in book club. Uh, I know this was a tough one. Next one is very easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I hear it's very easy. I've not read it, uh, yet. It's short. Uh, it's short. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I have read Kurt Vonnegut before I read Harris and Bergeron, which is just a short story, but that was a, a super easy read. Um, so the next book club is Slaughterhouse Five. It is on the evening before Halloween. October 30th, so less than a month, but it's an easy read. Juliet is going to be the host, uh, so get What's to it. What's the title it. again? Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, oh. Uh, yes. That would be fun to read again. I've mm -hmm. never read it, so. I've read um, it. It's lovely. It's lovely. Okay. It's okay. Good. Alex Alex and Caleb, is it an easier read than The Satanic Verses? Yes. By far. Very short. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That is it's not hard. Too. Uh, it's not hard to be easy. <laughs> Easier you and shorter. Probably, so you can knock you can that probably out read it weekend. three times, three times before the next book club easily without Excellent. trying. Excellent. It's very Excellent. short. All right. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone in chat. Uh, and uh, we'll call it a day. We'll see you for Narrative Dissonance tomorrow, uh, Monday. Later. Thanks for sticking around until the end. If you're new to Unsafe Space, check out our deep content library that includes discussions with everyone from James Lindsay to Brett Weinstein. And please consider helping to fund our work by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on a variety of social media platforms, and you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space Discord server which is open to financial supporters at any level. We hope to see you there. Warning, this is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. It would be better for your health if you forgot what you just heard. That should be easy for someone of your intelligence. The following co-conspirators are hereby ordered to watch CNN.
Experts agree that 87,000 new tax collectors will make inflation feel like less of a problem. I think we can agree that the FBI's track record speaks for itself. If you think about it, only government sanctioned experts should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Science, scientific, and scientifically are registered trademarks of the World Economic Forum. Unauthorized use is prohibited. Computer voice Curtis Never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.